All righty, uh, almost 9.30. Looking forward to another Sunday School lesson with you. Still dealing with the seven arrows. Arrow number six, um, how does the scripture um, call us to treat other people? And I'm going to be pulling up a screen to, to do this. So let me go ahead and get this ready so that we could watch this together. Let's see here. There we go. Um, first announcements, it wouldn't be Youth Sunday School without announcements. Uh, this Wednesday night, we'll be doing another Kahoot. Y'all, this has been so fun. And we're, do, we're playing for, for serious prizes. We're playing for a $20 gift card every single week. And we've had two different winners and looking to have a new winner this Wednesday night. I will release the, the categories that the questions will come from. Matter of fact, since you're tuning in to Sunday School, you will be the first to hear the categories. Um, different types of deodorant different cereal boxes, different fast food restaurants, random animal facts, and then of course questions from this week's Sunday School. So those are going to be the categories for Kahoot this week and Kahoot will be played on the Wednesday night Zoom meeting. And then following that meeting we will have um, another one of our testimony interviews this week. We are excited. That is our very own Bella Murdoch. She will be sharing her testimony through an interview we did together. Next week, another one of our very own, Elena Richmond, will be sharing her testimony. Several of you have told me that you're interested in doing a testimony interview. Please continue to communicate with me. Let's set up a time and a day to do that and um, get your interview on cue. Y'all, this is so important. Um, if we do not share our, our interview or share our testimony through interviews or just through everyday conversation, um, we are missing an opportunity to obey one of the greatest commands that Jesus told us to do, and that's to be his witnesses. So, um, be thinking about it. Um, I'll send the questions to you ahead of time so you can be looking at it and not be caught off guard. But I um, would love to, to get um, a collection of a lot of our teenagers' testimony interviews. And of course, Somersault still, as of now, is still going. It is still on. We're waiting to hear a final decision. And I believe that final decision will be made um, May the 15th, I believe, is the day that they're going to do that final decision. And um, some postcards are going out next week. Be on the lookout for that. Uh, if you're a graduating senior, you should be getting one. If you are in the youth group, you should be getting one. And if you're a rising seventh grader, you should be getting one as well. So looking forward to those postcards reaching your mailbox soon, sometime this week. So. The seven arrows, we have spent time on the first three arrows. Um, what does this passage say? I'm talking about the grammatical um, facts. Um, what does the scripture just say at face value when you read it? What did this passage mean to the original audience? That takes a little extra research, some history, some background, um, understanding how they understood um, different illustrations, um, different teachings, different examples. Um, number three, what does this passage tell us about God? So important because the more we know about God, the more we know about who we're called to be. Ephesians 5 said, be imitators of God. And you can't obey that commandment unless you're a student of who God is um, by what we learn in the scripture. And then number four, what does this passage 
tell us about people. Um, it's really important for us to understand ourselves and the people around us. That helps us know how to love. It helps us know how to forgive. And um, it helps us to basically obey um, number five and six, which number five is what does this passage demand of me? Um, we're learning about God. We're learning about ourselves. So, so what is our response? How do we um, react? Um, a proper reaction to God is called worship. A proper reaction to what we know about ourselves is called obedience or maybe even repentance. Um, number six, how does this passage change the way I relate to others? It is one thing to... Um, to expect certain things of how you treat yourself, but now you're looking at how does God want you to treat the people around you, and that's what we're going to look at more today. And then later on down the road, we're going to hit arrow seven. How does this passage prompt me to pray? Of course, prayer being one of our most powerful gifts that God has given us. Sadly, um, the strongest weapon we have is one that we use to lease, and I really can't explain that. It's, it's, uh, it's a shocking um, fact that we learn through studying um, stats and surveys that the average Christian does not take advantage of prayer. Um, I know in my personal life, um, I do not take advantage of prayer as I ought to, and that's something that we should be working on and pursuing every day of our Christian life is to pray better and our seven helps with that. So our number six is where we are today. How does this passage change the way that I relate to others? We have discussed starting last week that this chapter in this book breaks down Every pe every person that that we we know in the world in three categories. First of all, our, our family, which we spoke about last week. This week we're going to be speaking about the church. How does the Bible instruct us to treat the church? And then next week we're going to be talking about the unchurched. How does the Bible teach us to treat the unchurched? First of all, um, the the scriptures that we look at, um, letting us know about the importance of the church that we see in 2 Corinthians 11.2, Ephesians 5.27, Revelation 19.7. And these are all verses that describe the church as the bride of Christ. That's very, very important because before you neglect the church or ignore the church or, or um, just separate yourself from the church or or mistreat the church or talk bad towards the church you need to stop and remember that jesus considers the church to be his bride now i don't know about you but if somebody spoke bad about my bride that would bother me more than if they spoke bad about me so be very wise, be, be very aware that the church, even with all of its imperfections, is deeply loved by Jesus. He died for the church. He laid his life down for the church. And when you speak about the church and when you make choices about how you're going to treat or support the church, keep in your mind that Jesus desperately loves the church. And how we treat the church is going to be taken very personally by Jesus. Now, of course, last week we talked about Scripture giving us two types of instructions. One is a direct instruction. We read some scriptures that will tell us very specifically how to treat the church. And then there's applied principles. We'll read some expectations of who God wants us to be. And we can take these principles and apply it to how we treat the church as well. First thing I want to do is start talking about direct 
instructions. Now it's very interesting because there's direct instructions, it gives us one of the first things that we deal with with church. I know I have people who say to me from time to time, hey, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Hey, I don't have to go to church to worship. I can worship God anywhere. I can grow close to God anywhere. And those statements are not wrong. But the fact of the matter is, you cannot be an obedient Christian if you are not a part of a local group of believers or if you're not a part of the local church. The reason you can't be an obedient Christian and not go to church is because the Bible gives direct instructions on how to treat the church. You cannot obey these commands. You cannot obey these direct instructions on how to treat the church if you are not a consistent part of the church. Now, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, do not forsake the assemblings of yourself, um, basically teach us not to let missing church become a regular thing. Um, it uses the word habit, but make sure that missing church is a rare thing in your life. We live in a day where missing church is very common, and we live in a day where missing church can happen for a variety of reasons, some very trivial. Um, we want to watch a TV show, so we skip church to do it. Um, we, we want to do something when we should be doing our homework. So since I don't do my homework on Tuesday, I skip church so I can do my homework on Wednesday. Um, we don't prepare for certain things ahead of time so the last second comes, and to be able to prepare for it, we miss church. Um, we, we do too much stuff during the week, and then we're exhausted, so we rest during church. I mean, there's a lot of unimportant reasons we miss church. Now, there's some important reasons, too, um, that, that we want to be at church, but we just we're not able to. And it doesn't mean that you have to be at church 100% of the time, but it does mean that missing church should be very rare in your life if you want to be an obedient Christian. And that church should take a priority over many, many things in, in this world. Um, I believe that church should be a priority over many things that we refuse to let it be a priority over. I know we make decisions every day. I know that there's conflicts every day. And sometimes there's a conflict between two important things and we have to make a decision how we're gonna handle it. Church should be one of those important things. Sometimes church is a default skip. In other words, when all these important things conflict we work hard to figure out how to pull it off but if anything ever conflicts with church bam we skip church right away and if we have that attitude if we have that habit then we are disobeying the direct instructions we're about to look at we're disobeying this direct instruction that we see in hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 and it's important not because of rules and regulations, but it is important because of the relationship we have with Jesus to love the church because he loves the church. Love the church because he told us to, and our love for him pushes us to do things that we know good and well that pleases him. So let's look at some of those instructions. First of all, Romans chapter 15 verse 7 tells us to accept each other. This is one thing that we have to work on as a church. When people start to come into our church, if they're different or if we've had an argument in the past or if if our families have had issues in the past, or if we look different, talk different, it, it, I mean, whatever the case, whatever worldly issue divide us 
our spiritual commitment should unite us. It should trump all earthly things. Our relationship with Christ and our desire to please him should trump any temporary issue that separates us. So when someone comes into the church, that should be a safe place. That should be a place where they know people are going to accept them, treat them well, encourage them, even if you have your differences. Even if one of you are a Clemson fan and one of you are a Carolina fan, when you come to church, you should know that the things that unite you are greater than the things that divide you. And that thing is your love for Christ. Colossians chapter 3 verse 16 tells us to help each other learn. It says to teach each other. It uses the word reproof. In other words, like you proofread a paper. You help each other correct things in your life. Some things are new stuff. You're learning new stuff all the time, but some things you already knew about, you knew better. So we have to remind each other, hey, let's work on this. Hey, let's set some goals next week. Hey, how can we reach out to these people? How can we be kind to these people? Hey, I heard these people have a, a need, something went wrong. How can we help them? And when you begin to have that attitude, then we start becoming what the church was meant to become. And before we can love those outside of the church well, we must be really, really good at loving each other inside the church well. Galatians chapter 2, verse 2, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, tells us to help each other in hard times. And, and Colossians and Galatians goes really, really um, close together because we remind each other what we're supposed to be about is telling the truth of Christ in love. You can't separate them. You've got to be a people that love and you have to be a people that speak the truth. And when we are learning, we also have to put actions to it because there's an old cliche that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. This is very important to the church that you love each other, that you meet needs. When people are in hard times, you're there to help them up. And um, you do that because it is the way that Christ treats us. Therefore, it's the way we treat each other. And I, I'm trying not to get into people outside the church because that's supposed to be next week. But one thing you're going to see is what starts in the church is supposed to ripple effect to the rest of the world. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us to love those in the church who are difficult. It says be patient, bear with one another. Y'all, God's not done with me yet, and I may not do everything exactly how I should or how you want me to, but love me, forgive me, be patient with me, encourage me. Um, Bear with me in patience because the scripture tells you to and vice versa. There may be someone in my life that, that is difficult for me to be around. Um, a lot of people on Facebook say, cut that person out your life. You don't need that kind of negativity. Well, that's Facebook. The Bible says to love them anyway. The Bible says you love those who love you. Big deal. Love those who curse you. Love those who speak poorly about you, love those who are your enemies, that kind of love look more like Jesus than any other kind of love. So take that challenge. Be that person. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4.8, encourage each other because serving the Lord can be hard. You know, if I'm loving all my enemies, you better believe when I come around my friends, I'm going, I'm going to need somebody to pick me up. I'm going to need somebody to laugh with. I'm going to need somebody to encourage me. I'm going to need somebody to remind me, hey, you're doing the right thing. Don't give up. Keep doing it. Romans chapter 12, verse 10 says to be devoted to each other in love. Um, again, this word devoted um, means that we don't miss church. We're going to meet here because we are important to each other. And the reason we are important to each other is because we are important to Christ. Now, Jamie, isn't everybody important to Christ? Yeah, I know that. But listen to what God is telling us. God is telling us that there is a special relationship he is calling you to have with the people in your local 
church, to be devoted to one another. This is a direct commandment that Jesus has given us in regards to how we treat the church. And if the church is the first thing that we cut out every time that life gets busy or our calendar gets crowded, then I don't know that we can define that as being devoted to each other. Being devoted means we work hard to be together. We work hard to gather. We work hard to, to come together for the purpose of studying scripture like we do on Sunday morning. We come together for the purpose of ministry and, and outreach like we do on Wednesday night. We're devoted to it. We use the word devoted to a lot of things. And we do a lot better job of it when we're dealing with other things. But guys, if our love for Christ trumps the world, then our love for church should outshine our love for other stuff. It's just part of these direct commands. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 says, um, tells us to share Christian music with each other. That includes psalms, hymns, new music, all the time continue it says speak to one another with these three categories of music because music is such a big influence over our attitude and guys listen to what i'm telling you it's hard to put church first it's hard to obey jesus it's hard to live the christian life like god wants us to live the christian life so we got right here first thessalonians 4 18 we're encouraging each other but right here ephesians 5 19 it tells us a tool to use in encouragement and that is the great great music that god has given us and, and go check out some of those old hymns go check out some of the psalms in the book of psalms all of those, like, golly, I don't remember how. It's the biggest book of the Bible for a reason, because we need that much encouragement. All these new songs that are coming out, um, listen to them. Put them on your playlist. You know, don't just listen to them twice a week. Listen to them all week. Quote them to each other, because music changed our attitude. And guys, we got to have a good attitude if we're going to serve Christ well. Um, I set up a special video that I'm getting ready to play for you just to talk a little bit more about how neat it is the way music can affect us. Check this out. Hey, Miss Sheila. Hey. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about music because one of the verses that we're using this week about how to relate to the church through scripture talks about speaking to one another in hymns, mm -hmm. psalms, and spiritual songs. Yes. And a couple of things I want to ask you, um, not even talking about the lyrics, but just talking about music itself. Does music have the ability to affect our moods? Absolutely. All the great composers have learned that if you want people to feel happy and satisfied, you write, in a, you, uh, write your music in a major chord like this. And it makes you feel happy and upbeat. If you want to be thoughtful or sad or um, quiet, you might make a minor key. So hear the difference, major, minor. Kind of and nostalgic. It, yes, or, or sad if you like, um, but it gives it a whole different feel, major, minor. And if you're angry or you want it to sound scary or suspenseful, then you could do a diminished. And it gives it a whole different feel. So depending on what the composer or the writer wants their listener to feel, they can decide whether they want to do major, minor, uh, diminished, or there's an augmented too. So. What's well, so Is it just the chords or is it the speed too? Speed can affect it. Good question. So if you um, you can do a minor key and still have an up tempo, and it will have a different feel than if you do a minor key at a slow tempo, because that's probably going to lean more towards the sad feel, where right. where the up tempo may lean more towards just thoughtful. What would you describe hopeful as, as far as chords and speed? Probably major. Oh, really? At a moderate to um, fast tempo would be hopeful and happy. Somewhere over the rainbow. What what is mm. that? It 
kind of a, a hopeful or almost a sad feeling. Yeah, it is. But, mm -hmm. but then depends on who's do, doing it. it. Julie Garland doing it. And then mm. um, what was the Hawaiian dude? Um, oh, on the ukulele. Yeah. He had a whole different feel. Mm -hmm. What Did he change? Because it, it feels like a, a similar notes, but uh, it was. It's the same notes. There, um, that might be A minor instead of C major. So just the slightest change mm -hmm. totally. Yeah, just a little change can do it. Impact. Well, tell me about the, the hymns. Do both hymns and contemporary Christian music um, affect the moods by, by doing these chord changes? Oh, sure. And, and if you've ever paid attention to the way we do hymns with the praise team, sometimes we might do a hymn, Peppy, and I'll say, Steve, play it faster. And he'll look at me and shake his head and play it faster. <laughs> or we'll say, let's slow this down. Let's drag this out. And that just changing the tempo um, can affect how it makes you feel. Without even touching the Without notes. messing with modality or anything. When Tell I, me about some of the contemporary Christian music. Do you actually see them doing new methods to, to touch us or encourage us or to, to uplift us? Okay. How many people out there view their relationship with God in a way that's the same as the way we view it? or maybe in a way that we hadn't thought of before. And they've poured their heart into the lyrics of that song. And they've awakened a new idea for us. Oh, I never thought about expressing my love for God in that way. Mm -hmm. I, I never thought about thinking about the situation in the way the writer of the song has thought about it. And there are times when you need uplifting and they've written something that, that brings you up. I, can, I have church in the car mm -hmm. <laughs> because of the power of a song and the lyrics and the music with it. It's so important. So, um, so sometimes the simplicity is, is a plus. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. As far as connecting with certain populations. Yes, yes. And people who don't pay a lot of, of attention to the mechanics of music probably don't notice as much. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time and showing this because um, when the scriptures tell us to use music um, to, to not only honor God, but to encourage each other, um, it's amazing um, how deep of an impact it makes from not only the lyrics, but the speed all the way down to the very notes. Yes, yes. The music is one of the greatest gifts ever given to us by the Father. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. So thank you, Miss Sheila, for doing that. And it's just a reminder of how important music is. So make sure that, that when you're using music, you use it to lift you up. You, you use it to encourage yourself. You use it to encourage others. Um, it is really wise that if you are listening to music that has a message that contradicts the things of scripture that you just delete it i mean why would you want to to allow that tool to pull you away from christ pull you away from his truth when you could use that tool to completely push you towards his will his heart his principles now we've talked about the direct commandments now let's talk about applied principles there are instructions and examples in, in Scripture that may not specifically be talking about the church, but it can certainly be used to learn how to serve the church. In Mark chapter 12, verses 41 and 44, Jesus tells the story of the widow's might. Now, this was before the church even began, but we see the principle of giving. We see the principle of bringing a gift into the storehouse, collecting all the gifts together so that we could do something with those um, in unity that we could not have done separated. We see the example of the widow that just did not give 10% but gave the best gift that she could. And even though that gift was smaller than all of these people showing off and, 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 and showboating in front of all these other people, Jesus was blown away because she gave her gift in faith and gave her gift in love. And that is a great thing that we can learn from. And even though it's not speaking specifically about the church, we can take that principle and put it to the church to be, be a contributor, not just a consumer.
to, to be someone who wants to be the reason the church improves, not simply someone who benefits only from the church. That can be money, but it also could be a positive attitude. It could be a smile. It could be consistency. It could be attendance. It could be just speaking well about the church um, in the community in front of all those people. It could be social media. I know a lot of churches that are doing well, their members always brag on, on the things that their church is doing. They don't let anything go uncelebrated. So when you decide that you're going to be a person that strengthens the church, you use everything at your disposal to make that happen. And um, social media could be one thing. Um, financial gifts could be one thing. Um, your skills, your talent, things you're good at could be one thing. You use it all to make the church better. And then we got the book of Job. A lot of you know um, how Job um, just suffered from disease, suffered from financial ruin, suffered from loss of loved ones. And he was in a terrible place, a low place, a dark place. And really we see in the book of Job a terrible example of how to encourage and how to minister and, and how to treat. But we can even learn from the mistakes and make sure that when people in our church is suffering, that we bless them and we encourage them and we do a better job of, of serving them than Job's friends did of serving him. We learn um, who God is and how he is always good despite what we're going through. And these are things that we can encourage each other about and also encourage each other because now we know that if we endure, if we persevere, that God's blessings are always in front of us. And anything that we go through while we're here on earth is going to be totally worth it because it promises us that all things work together for the good for those who love the Lord. John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, to love in the same way that I have loved you. So we have a command to follow the example of love that Jesus gave to us. Now, what I want you to do is write down John chapter 13, verse 34, and then go back to the direct command we studied a little bit earlier in Romans chapter 12, verse 10. We see that scripture supports scripture and a lot of times the direct the demands are supported by applied principles and many times applied principles will later be specified with direct commands so in wrapping up i want us to look at two more applied principles first of all john chapter 13 verse 34 jesus says to love in the same way that he loves. But in John chapter 21, verse 17, it says, Peter, do you love me? And when Peter says yes, then he says, go love others. Now, here's the two principles I want you to get. First of all, we see the principle in John 13, love like Jesus. In John chapter 21, we learn the principle, love because of Jesus. So we know why and we know how. And then also John 21 tells us who. Um, in Matthew, it says, whatever you do to the least of these, you've done unto me. So that helps us know who as well. Um, thank you for tuning in to the Sunday School lesson. Thank you for um, loving and pursuing our Lord. Thank you for blessing other people in his name. Thank you for sharing his truth and his love. And thank you for doing to others in the same exact way that Jesus has done unto you. Um, count your blessings. Don't be distracted by challenges. And praise the name of the one who died and rose again for our salvation. I love you, and I hope you have a great, great day. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. I'm going to go back to the main screen. Um, I learned last week that typing my email in the chat does absolutely nothing. It's not helpful. 
but I will tell you that if you go to our church website, um, www.honeyofpathfirstbaptist.org, then there's contact information there. Um, also, you're watching this on Facebook more than likely, um, so you can go to um, my page at Jamie Williams or this page at um, Honey Path First Baptist, and you can message there. Um, but reach out to me. Let me know if you got questions, if you got prayer requests. I would be honored to serve you in any way. I love you. Have a great morning, and tune in uh, for our worship service that will be beginning at 1030. Until next time, bye-bye.